So we're going to cover ANCOVA. We're going to do a two-way between subjects ANCOVA and additionally a uh, repeated measures ANCOVA. So. <clears throat> All right, so with ANCOVA, what you're trying to do that you're not doing in regular ANOVA is first control for some covariate. That's where the C comes from. So I'm trying to um, analyze the difference between groups or between levels uh, given that I know this other thing varies with my dependent variable, I first want to control for it. So I have this example data where I have um, for the between subjects design two independent variables employed where uh, people are employed or unemployed, so it's got two levels, and then religion where there are four different religion types, none or other, Protestant, Jewish, or Catholic. So say two by four between subjects and COVA. I'm going to use um, my uh, <clears throat> dependent variable is going to be attitudes towards drugs. It's this variable over here. And I'm going to first control for physical health, which is this variable. Because I know that um, people who have more health symptoms or health problems might be on more medication. And if the medication is helping them, they might have more positive attitudes towards the use of drugs. Or the reverse, it could be that people who are having to take lots of medications sort of don't want to be taking them, so they could have more negative attitudes. So I know this variable influences these attitudes, and I first want to control for it, and then examine the relationship between employment status and religion on those attitudes. So I'm looking to first control and then examine the um, for some independent differences. Um, <clears throat> so to do that, I'm going to first calculate and see if I have enough people in my data set. So I'm going to use G power. <clears throat> so with G power for ANCOVA, first thing you're going to do is pick F test. And then it's actually the automatic option. So ANCOVA, there's only one option. So we're going to pick ANCOVA, fixed effects, main effects, and interactions. Um, <clears throat> you want to always leave this as a priori. Your effect size F. 0.10 is small, 0.25 is medium, 0.4 is large. Sometimes when you hover over it, you can get it to give it to you. There you go. Or you can hit determine and calculate from an eta squared. Um, so I'm going to leave this as a medium effect size. Close that. Uh, alpha is always 0.05. Power we like to set to 0.8. Now numerator degrees of freedom kind of depends on what you're looking for. It could be for one main effect, levels minus one, so I could do two minus one or four minus one. Or you can do levels minus one times levels minus one for the interaction. I always tell people to go with the largest number because that will tell you the biggest of, uh, sample size. So I could do two minus one, that's one. Three minus one, that's, I'm sorry, four minus one, that's three. Or if I multiply them together, it's still three. So I'm gonna go with three. The number of groups is the number of conditions. So I've got two by four, so that's eight conditions. And I have one covariate of physical health. So let's hit calculate. And it says I need 179 people to find a significant effect for this study. Okay. Let's see how many I have. I've got well over that amount. I've got three, four hundred, oh, four hundred-ish people. So I should be good. I have way more than it says I need to find a difference if that difference is actually there. All right, so to check the assumptions, um, I first also want to check for um, accuracy and missing data. <clears throat> and so I am on page 168 of the notes. And so to do that, I would go analyze descriptives, frequencies. I'm using attitudes towards drugs as my DV, physical health as my CV, and then my two IVs. Under statistics, I'm gonna pick min and max definitely to make sure I don't have anything crazy. But if I also wanna look at the mean, standard deviation, skew and kurtosis for my other variables as kind of like a preview of what's gonna happen for normality and just kinda of make sure nothing looks too crazy. And then turn off frequency tables or you'll get some crazy numbers for, or some big tables for your two continuous variables. Okay. 
Okay, get bigger here. There we go. <clears throat> Alright, so attitude towards the use of drugs runs 5 to 10. Okay, so if it's... I gotta know what the scale is, so I'm gonna assume this is accurate. And 2 to 15 for physical health. If I'm looking at these, they're my um, CV and DV. The means don't look too nuts. The standard deviations aren't too large for this uh, type of range of the data. And skew and kurtosis are okay. So kind of a preview for normality. My current employment status is one and two, so I don't have any random threes. And then one through four, so I don't have any um, zeros or negative numbers when I shouldn't. And then looking across here, I have three missing people under religious affiliation. But I can't really guess at that, so I'm not going to fill it in. So you don't want to fill in or estimate um, categorical variables, especially that type of demographic information, um, because having them as a 2.5 doesn't make any sense, and then when you try to run the ANCOVA, it will um, have a fit. <clears throat> All right, so our accuracy and our missing data are fine. I would have to get rid of three people who don't have religion, but when I run the analysis, SPSS will ignore them anyway. All right, so let's check univariate outliers, but I'm going to do that on my CV and my DV. So analyze, descriptives, descriptives. Okay. Now just the CV and DV. I'm going to leave the two IVs alone because I've already checked them for the only things that you're going to check for. Okay. So I've got attitudes towards these drugs and physical health symptoms. Okay. Stave standardized values as variables. Okay. <clears throat> okay. That's going to give me the means again. Cool. But really what I'm interested in are these z-scores out here. So I can right click, since I only have two, this is a little faster. Right click, ascending, nobody is below three. Descending, nobody is above three, so I'm good. Ascending, and descending. Uh, I do have some outliers on this physical health um, variable. So I have, I think, four. Yes, four people whose physical health symptoms are higher than you would expect. Now one thing I can do is look at the variable and it's, it's just continuing on out. So there is a small amount of people in the tail here, but it's not as if it stops at 10 and suddenly there's a 35. Um, they are just higher than everyone else. So really, I'd want to make sure I don't have any multivariate outliers because then I can tell if the pattern or this combination of the CV and DV is weird as opposed to just one individual variable at a time. So to do that, we need to run a fake regression. So I'm going to first make a random variable. Transform compute. Call it random. We'll go down to, I clicked on R um, to get random numbers real quick. RV chi-square, because that's what Mahal Novus is based on. And the magic number seven. Um, and it just, seven just seems to work really well. Uh, don't use anything less than three, because then you don't get enough variance. Let's hit OK. So I'm not, now i got a new random column, and I'm going to analyze the data for um, multivariate outliers. So let's go analyze, regression, linear. We're going to put the random variable in our dependence box. We're going to put our CV, so physical health symptoms, and our DV, attitudes towards the use of drugs, in the... Um, <clears throat> Independence box. Okay, so I'm analyzing the pattern across the CV and the DV. So, but no IVs because we don't screen them after for categorical IVs. You don't screen them after accuracy and missing. So plots, Z pred and Y, Z residual and X, histogram, normal probability plot. Continue, and then save Mahalanobis and then hit OK. okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back to the data here. Now I've got my new Mahalanobis column. I'm going to right click and sort descending. And so now I have all of the people at the top, which you'll notice are also some of our univariate outliers. Not all of them, but some of them. But what's my cutoff score? Well, I need a to look at my chi-square table, I have two variables, one for the CV, one for the DV. So degrees of freedom 2 is 13.82 is my cutoff score. And so I have two 
multivariate outliers. And that's probably because their physical health symptoms are so high um, and their attitudes are also high. So those would be um, our multivariate outliers. I could get rid of them, but since I'm going to use this data set again in a minute to show you a repeated measures and COVA, I'm not, <laughs> so that you can see this whole process again. Um, but in general, I'd probably delete these people, but if you've got two people in a set of over 400, they don't tend to make a huge difference unless their scores are really crazy. And I'd argue they're probably not because they fall within the line of the data. They're just at the tails. <clears throat> but you could delete them just fine. Now, with ANCOVA, you do have to check for multicollinearity between the CVs. You want your CV and your DV to be correlated. That's the point of ANCOVA, is to control for the fact that you know there's a correlation. Um, and so multicollinearity really becomes a problem when the CVs are too correlated. So if I had multiple control variables and they're all highly correlated, I am losing power by using multiple variables that overlap. Um, and so it's sort of like having, um, let's say you want to represent a, a set of colors and you're picking like four reds. Well, you haven't really covered the whole range of colors, you've just picked a couple reds. Um, so you only want to use one variable, so you don't want them to overlap too much. Um, in this data, I only have one CV, so I wouldn't run anything. But if you had multiple CVs, you would do a bivariate correlation. And this rule is actually different than your normal multicollinearity rules. It's about 0.7. At 0.7, pick one of them. Don't use both. Um, and because that's because at, at a correlation of 7, that's 49% of the variance that overlaps. So that is half of their variance that's the same. And so you're losing more power than you're gaining by adding that extra control in there. Okay, so you want variables that um, are correlated with a DV but not correlated with each other if that's possible. So I don't have any at the moment, um, but I left some notes on how you might do that uh, in the how-to guide. But in this case, since I only have one, I'm just going to skip it. We didn't delete any outliers, although I probably should have. So I'm going to go back to my output and look at these charts. So kind of starting with linearity because that's <clears throat> what I have next in the notes. And the one, the picture in the notes looks really crazy, but this one tends to look okay. If you weren't sure about this combination, um, because it's not quite on the line, you could run a bivariate scatter plot between your CV and your DV. If you have multiple CVs and DVs, you could do a scatter matrix. Okay, so let me show you that. So go to graphs, chart builder, under here pick scatter dot, and then this is the scatter matrix or scatter plot matrix option. So double click on that to get it here at the top and pick the multiple variables you want to use. Going through chart builder only three or four at a time seem to work. Um, if you go through legacy dialogues it works a little better but I only have two so I'm just going to do these two. So I got attitude towards these drugs and physical health symptoms. Highlight both of them at once. I'm holding down the control key uh, to get both of them. I'm going to drag them together till I get the red cross plus and then let go. And then hit OK. And what that does is it creates me um, all the combinations of the variables. So it kind of runs like a post hoc test and it gives me attitude towards drugs and physical health symptoms and then physical health symptoms and attitudes. So if you only have two variables, this is a little redundant, but just to show you how to do it. Um, and you want to make sure these don't look curvilinear. Right now they just look like a bunch of dots, right? Because they are, um, while it is a ratio scale, it could be zero. Um, it does not have decimals, so that's why you got these sort of straight patterns of dots. The other cool thing is if you aren't totally sure, you can double click on it and actually add fit lines. So this button, add fit line at total and it will let you add fit lines to the graph. So you could play around with, does it look better if it's quadratic? Um, or is it better if I just leave it as linear? And I would argue that these are, you know, the correlation is not huge, but they're linearly related. <clears throat> um, and so it is not curvilinear, as we see here. All right, so that's linearity. Let's go back up to normality. And this is slightly problematic, it's a slight positive skew, so it runs from 2 to 2, but I've got some people out here at 3 and 4, so some positive skew. 
let's, to figure out which variable that is, I could look at my descriptive statistics. So analyze descriptives frequencies. I'm going to take out my two categorical variables. And I'm going to hit statistics. And I've actually got skew and kurtosis already selected, but that's really what I want to look for. So continue and OK. Right. So looking here at skew, I'm good. Kurtosis, I'm good. So while this graph, sorry, this one is not perfect, it doesn't seem to be problematic. The univariate normality is pretty good. I could also get um, the univariate histograms. I think if you did that, you'd see why there's a skew. So analyze, descriptives, frequencies. You can do all this at once. I'm just showing you one step at a time. Um, charts, histograms, show normal curve. Continue and OK. okay. That looks nice and pretty and normal. It's like very univariate. Um, no, sorry, unimodal. But this is the one that's causing the skew. And that's because we have a couple of these little outliers out here. And there's nobody down here. Um, and so if I had deleted these outlier people, I would have less skew. But it was only two people. Okay. The other thing is, remember, norm normality is rather robust. I have more than 30 people, so I should be okay for the distribution of means. So the test statistic is not quite so biased. <laughs> All right. Now, the next thing we want to check is homogeneity and homoscedasticity. So remember, homogeneity is the equality of variances. So I want to look at the zero line here going across. Is there an even spread around zero? And I'd say there isn't. Right, so it runs to negative four down here, and so there are a lot more dots down here than the spread is up here. It sort of stops. The other way is to look this way at zero, and you've got the same problem. So homogeneity might be a problem, but I can check Levine's. I will get that in this test. The other thing we want to check is homoscedasticity because this is partially regression. So what happens is the CV gets regressed on the DV, which takes out the variance due to that variable and then it runs the um, ANOVA. Okay, it actually does all that simultaneously, but the idea is that it's like first step, control for CV, second step, look at the levels of the IV or the conditions. So since it is partially regression, we want to make sure uh, homoscedasticity is covered. And remember that that is that you basically want the dots to be an even spread across, um, across zero here. And it's not the same thing as homogeneity, where I want the spread to be um, even across zero in the sense of, like, this runs from 1.75 to 4, and that's my problem. Uh, instead, I'm concerned with how they look. There are no holes. And I would say this is mostly covered. There are more dots here in the middle, and there, there's, there's clearly missing stuff out here. So the dots are more clustered over here. But on the whole, it's fairly consistent until you look at this stuff. So these sorts of triangles are tend to be bad because you're missing data somewhere. So I'd say this one's sort of iffy um, because if you draw a line around the dots, it should look like a blob, and this sort of looks like a fish. Um, so that's not good for us. But what you want to see is a nice even spread of random dots. Okay, slightly different from the fact that I want this spread of dots to be even on either side of zero. Homoscedasticity is that there's an even spread of the dots. Homogeneity is that the dots are evenly distributed around zero. <clears throat> All right. So I might have to fix some of those problems, but to continue with this example, let me show you how to run the test. So all of that was data screening. So let's go analyze. <coughs> excuse me. General linear model. And it's all repeated, uh, excuse me, all between subjects. So it's univariate. I'm going to put my, um, my DV in here, so attitudes towards use of drugs in the dependent variable. I'm going to take my two IVs, current religious employment, uh, current religion and employment, good gracious, in the fixed factors box. And then you just add your physical health symptoms in the covariate box. So the only thing we're doing different from a two-way between subjects on NOVA is adding something down here to make it ANCOVA. You'll notice when you did that, your post hoc option went away. 
So SPSS sort of hates you when it comes to ANCOVA because there's just, there's not a whole lot of consensus on post hocs. Um, if you do some Google searching, you will see, much like I have, that people can't really agree. Um, and so there's, it just grays it out. It won't do them. <clears throat> but you can cheat a little bit and hit uh, options. I'm going to move over all three variables into display means. But now I've got this compare main effects. So I actually can get the post talks for um, the main effects only. Remember, SPSS never does interactions for you. You always have to do something else. And I can get it with a Bonferroni or Sidoc correction. And so those corrections are, are, I guess, a little easier than the Tukey kinds of corrections for ANCOVA um, because it will it's controlling for P only, and it's not calculating these new mean values. Um, and so I can get post hocs for the main effects only. And the real problem here is that once you click on this, it gives it to you no matter what. So if you only have two levels, don't forget that you need to ignore this output. So descriptives, effect size, homogeneity for Levine's. I'm going to hit continue. Um, you can also look at plots. Put one in the horizontal, one in separate lines. Hit add and then switch them. And this will help me look and see what I want to do for my interaction. Continue. And so those aren't plots that you might present to a journal. Um, and I really tried to figure out how to make them look journal ready, but there's just doesn't seem to be a way to get error bars, which is like the crux of it. And you really need those. So I'm going to show you how to do them in Excel um, in this video. But if you figure it out, you please leave me a note and I will add it to this video. Okay. Now I've got everything set up, so I'm going to hit OK. Now, uh, this is actually going to be highlighted in the next video about repeated measures and COVAs, but let me show you something real quick. So, analyze, general linear model, and univariate. Okay. With uh, between subjects and COVA, you do not automatically get the interaction between the CV and the two IVs. You get the CV as a main effect, but no interaction. Now, in repeated measures, you get the CV interacting with the IVs no matter what. It's automatic. Um, so if you are wanting to add in that interaction between your IVs and your CV, i.e. you want the interaction, the three-way interaction, and not just the main effect, that's actually going to be here under model. Okay. So you actually can add that in manually into SPSS if you're interested. Um, a lot of people don't because they're talking about, I just want to control and then look at this sort of thing. But if you wanted to do it, it would be here under custom. And then you could highlight all of them and get it to give you, I think it's just interaction here. Oops, sorry. There's one called full factorial sometimes, but okay. Uh, so I can get it to give me the interaction. Let's see. Maybe if I click all three way, all the two way interactions. Okay, maybe not. So it will let you add this. Um, three-way interaction in there and then I think it'll, it should give you all of the rest of them as well. Uh, so that's how you could add that that extra piece if you wanted it to have that and most people don't so they don't they ignore that part. Okay let me turn this off. Right. Okay. okay so looking at that output that was sort of a preview for the next video. What is going on? So the first thing you get is your um, your notation of how many people are in each level you get the uh, descriptive statistics box, which tells me um, the means for each group, the standard deviations, and n. The only thing I'm going to use this for is n. These means are the unadjusted means. So the point of ANCOVA is to adjust these scores and then test the differences. And so you don't want to use the unadjusted scores. You'll see that the adjusted scores are only slightly different. Um, so it'll sort of feel like, why am I going to all this work for slightly different numbers? But when you're doing ANCOVA, the point is you're first controlling. So you don't want to use the uncontrolled numbers. Okay, but I do need this box for N because it's one of the only places N is going to appear. All right, the next thing is you get Levine's test. So with Levine's test, we're looking at homogeneity. And I said, well, it might not be so good because look at this graph. It's not so hot. Um, it is not significant. So we're good. Uh, we're covered for homogeneity. <clears throat> So what's going on? Let me copy this, show you in Word here. <clears throat> All 
Okay, let's see what that's actually going to paste. Nothing. Okay. Well, apparently SPSS is just going to be cranky today, so I will take a screenshot. Twink. There we go. <clears throat> so, um, what the Between Subjects box gives me is the main effect of the CV, the main effect of my two IVs, and the interaction of my two IVs. So I first want to look at the main effect of my CV. Is the, the um, covariant a significant adjuster of the mean, is the way people talk about it. So is it significantly related to the DV that I need to control for it? And in this case, the answer is yes. Okay, so I'm going to do F of physical health here. So 1, 453 okay. equals 6.65 P equals 0 0.01 and then partial eta squared, which you want to do the real symbols for, is 0 0.01. So yes, it's a significant adjuster of the DV, although it's kind of a small effect. So what do I do with that 0.01 number? Um, or what do I do now? So I know it's a significant adjuster of the, of the DVs, but what does that mean? Often what you can do is just run a correlation to see how they're related to each other. So you tell people well, how they're related and it's important to control for it, so immediately the next question is, well, how are they related? So go analyze, correlate, bivariate, now our CV and our DV. Okay, so we haven't done this before because remember, as part of the data screening, I don't, I want the CV and DV to be correlated. I would be, co I would be looking at CVs only. So they are related at 0.13 and the P is 0 0.007. So you would say that R, little r, is 0.13. P equals 0.007. Here's a tip. You can also take the square root of partial eta. So if I did 0.01, I took the square root. It gives me a, a, a relatively close number. Okay. Um, and the reason why it's not perfect is because there's actually more decimals out here. Oh, I should have done 0.014. There we go. And that's even closer, 0.12. Um, and there are more decimals that would make them perfectly the same, but um, two decimals is usually pretty good. And that's going to be useful for us when we get to repeated measures and COVA in the next section. Um, so one of the follow-ups for a main effect of a CV is to kind of look at the correlations between the CVs and the DV. Let's now look at the main effect of our first IV, which is employment and that is not significant. So what I can do when f is less than 1 like this, you can do this. Uh, personally, I prefer to tell people what my degrees of freedom were. So I would say 1, 453 is less than 1. Um, but that's kind of a stylistic preference. So p is 0.5, partial eta squared is less than 0.01. Okay. So there's no significant effect of employment. So let me look here. I'm going to scroll up till I get to the estimated marginal means for employment. So here. Now remember, this is what I was saying a minute ago. Even though there are only two levels, it gave me the bond for only anyway. So this is not a box you should look at. You should pretend actually that you don't see it because it is doing the ANOVA again. Okay, so I don't want that. But for my current employment status, I don't have any differences. So I would report these means, these adjusted means, um, so that's what the little a means, is that they are adjusted in standard errors. Um, and see it says right here, control for physical health. And so there is no difference between those two. And like if you're looking at the numbers, clearly there's no difference. <clears throat> what about the main effect of religion? Let me go back up here. So I've got 3 and 453. Oops, typing in space here. 
and that is 2.55. It's really close. P is equal to 0.06 of our roundup. Partial eta squared is equal to 0.02. If I wanted to interpret this effect, um, and it were significant, not just marginal, I would look at these two boxes. So I've got my <clears throat> main effect of religion. So what it's going to give me, it'll copy, here we go, is the, the means, the estimated marginal means where that are adjusted for physical health and their standard errors, and then actually gives me the Bonferroni. So it's running an independent t-test on those um, marginal means in the background, and then is calculating the adjusted p-value if I were to control for the fact that I'm running, um, it's four, so one, two, three, four, five, six post hocs. So I could talk about each one of these at a time, none versus other, uh, none or other versus Catholic is significantly different after controlling for running six, but none of the rest of them are. So the only difference in means is um, no religion or other religion versus Catholics. And no religion or other religion has a lower attitude towards the use of drugs. Catholics are more positive about drugs. Okay. <clears throat> and so um, I could do this and I get a, a appropriate post hoc because it's controlling for the physical health symptoms. Now what about my interaction? Because that's where all the action is at, right? So it's going to be 3 and 453. It's 2.86, and that's also significant. So let's see. Go down here. So 3, 453. 2.86. P. 0. 0.4. My italics. Typing fingers are not working with me today. Partial eta squared is 0.02. Okay. So that is significant. <clears throat> so what do I do when my interaction is significant? Because um, post hocs run in SPSS are often um, going to be an independent t-test. Well, an independent t-test is not going to control for my covariate. So let me first figure out what I want to do when it comes to um, when I'm trying to uh, analyze this interaction. So I could compare four employed people. What are the differences in all these religions? So that would be this way, and then compare these. So for employed people, it looks like nothing is different really, and then for unemployed people, there's a difference. Or for each religion, I could compare these two points at a time. So employed versus unemployed for none, employed versus unemployed for Catholic, etc., Protestant, Jewish. Okay, so I have a two by four. So let me give you this in table format real quick. Two by four. <clears throat> and so what I could do is compare across. And so that would be one versus two here, and then one versus three, and then one versus four. So that's three tests. But then I also have to do two versus three, two versus four. So that's two more tests, and then three versus four. And so that ends up being, when you compare across this way, 12 different tests, because I have six for each row. And that's a lot of tests to be running. Instead, I could do one versus one here, two versus two, three versus three, four versus four, and be done. Okay, so when you're talking about applying this across or down kind of rule, it's easier to go the direction with less levels, um, unless you have a very specific hypothesis and then go with that. Um, and so the first rule of analyzing data is do what your advisor tells you, and then the second rule is go with the go with the the smaller number of levels um, so that you are controlling for type one error. Okay, so I could do twelve tests, but instead I'm going to do four. Now, I have uh, in the notes uh, three different ways to do this. So I'm going to show you from least head bashing to most head bashing. And the reason I say that is because there's no good way to do this. In SPSS, probably in R is probably the best way, but um, this is an SPSS guide, so I won't show you that. But um, there's, there's pros and cons to each of these. 
So uh, what I would, would like to do first is the easiest one to run that doesn't require you to leave SPSS, but probably the least power that you would get out of this analysis. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. Um, and so what I'm going to do is set up a little, t a little box, essentially what I did here, before my test. So you want me to F. So I would pick my analyses. Oops, I did too many columns. Okay, give me big. There we go. Okay, so I've decided to can go down and compare across the employment factors. So I'm going to do none employed versus none unemployed. Okay, spelling today. Uh, and then I'm going to do Catholic, the same thing, employed versus Catholic unemployed. Uh, Protestant employee versus Protestant unemployed and then our last group Jewish employee versus Jewish unemployed so you'll notice that in each one of these I have kept one thing constant and varied the other okay, and that's how postdocs for conditional means have to work one thing stays constant and will vary the other two now, normally, if you've watched my other videos, you'll see that I normally list T here. But the first thing we're actually going to try is doing this as individual group and COVAs. So we're going to do pairwise and COVAs to get these means. So what does that imply? Well, ANCOVA, I'm sorry, ANOVA and T tests are the same thing when you only have two levels. So a between subjects one way ANOVA with two levels is the exact same thing as an independent T test. And that's why I said, when you're doing main effects and there are two levels, don't run anything else. Like, ignore that Bonferroni output that you got. Um, but I can't just run an independent t-test because I need to control for the means. So I want to run, um, sorry, scrolls. Uh, I want to run an analysis on these numbers here and not the regular descriptives that are provided um, at the top. And so if you just run independent T, you're basically ignoring the fact that you had a CV. You said your CV is important, so why wouldn't you want to analyze the post hoc with the CV? So what we're going to do is run pairwise and COVAs and get it controlled with the CV. The, the con to this analysis is you do lose power because you still have to control for the CV, so you are... Um, taking away some of your degrees of freedom by, by controlling for it. Um, so this is probably the easiest thing to run, um, but also because you're, you're not having to go find other programs or do anything else, but you are also having to deal with the loss of power. So this is probably not the way I would suggest doing it for like a thesis, um, but it is a, an option. <clears throat> so... Because this is double between subjects, we still have to use that split file, so we're not doing anything too different. Um, so we can get them pairwise, because otherwise you got to do a lot of data uh, select cases, and that is like the slowest, most painful thing ever. So we're going to use split file. So let's go data, split file. I want to compare employed versus unemployed. So I don't want to split on that variable. You always split on the variable that's larger. So I'm going to go religion here. Hit OK. <clears throat> now I'm going to run that exact same ANCOVA. It's going to split them by religion, so I've only got one left. Uh, employment versus unemployment. So analyze. General linear model and univariate. This is still set up because I haven't closed it yet. But be sure you take out the variable you split on or it will give you a very cranky error message because you can't run a split file and run on the same variable. Everything else I'm going to leave the same, but if you look at options, it's basically just taken out the effects of religion. Okay. I would still leave this on. So let's say you have um, 
a three by four. And so you've split it on the four, but you still have three. And so it stops being a pairwise in ANCOVA. What you could do is if you leave this on, it will do those extra pairwises for you and actually control for them, which is kind of nice. Um, and so if the overall ANCOVA is significant, you could look at the pairwise um, effects, or you could just go straight to the pairwise um, and look at those if you have more than two levels. So if you're running a big design, like a 3x4 or a 3x5, you can um, use this compare main effects to your advantage. Okay. So I'm going to leave it on, even though I don't need it. I'm going to hit OK. So I'm going to get four of these. Um, the first thing that happens is because I had some missing data here for religious affiliation, um, these are my three missing cases. It tried to run all my missing cases here. Um, and so I want to ignore this completely because I didn't actually use those people they're missing, but it will still give them to you because it's an, one of the, the, when you split file, it separates the missing people into another file. Okay. So I've got my none or other here, dual screen. So for the non group, who's first? Um, I'm going to go down here to my ANCOVA and I'm just going to look at employment. Um, so interesting fact, my physical health is not significant, but I'm not concerned with that right now. I'm just looking at employment, so it's 1 and 73. So I'm not going to do my italics, but don't forget there are italics. 1, 73 is 3.24. P is 0 0.08, so it's not significant. My partial eta squared is 0 0.04. And my explain is they're not different, Okay, because that P is not less than 0 0.05. I could look at the means down here. So these are the adjusted means for um, none, for employed versus unemployed. And like I said, it gives you the pairwise comparisons and that would be where you'd want to look if your test had three or more levels, but we don't, so I'm going to ignore it. So I'm going to scroll, scroll, scroll. This is Catholic down here. If you get to scroll and you've lost which one it is, it says right here at the bottom too for you. Um, it says at the start of each one and then it says at the bottom of, of each one. Uh, test. Okay, so for my Catholic group, it's 1 and 116 is 3.43 and P is 0.07. Okay, so two marginal effects. Eta squared is 0.03, so I would say they're not different. And then I would use these means to report. Now let's go down here to Protestant. So it's 1 and 172. Okay, so 1, 172 is 3.40. P is 0.06. Sorry. 0.07 rounded up. And then. 0.02 for ADA, so it's not different. And then last but not least, let's do Jewish. Let's go in here. So it's 1 and 89. Equals, oh, it's less than 1. P equals 0.53. And then ADA is 0.01. So also not different. Okay, so wait, what happened? Um, I had a significant interaction, and so I'm saying there are differences between conditions, but then none of them came out significant. They're close. I got three marginal effects and um, one very one that's not significant very clearly. But what's happening? And um, why didn't I get any significant post hocs? This happens a couple times. This will happen in a couple different ways, um, especially if the interaction is small. And so our, our overall interaction is a small effect. So partial A is only 0 0.02. And remember, 0.01 is considered a small effect. Um, sometimes if the interaction is small, your correction, Tukey, post hoc, uh, Tukey, Bonferroni, Chef A, um, Fisher Hater, will wipe out those small differences. So by using a correction factor, we've, we've lost the differences um, because the interaction was so small. In this case, that's not the problem because we're not really correcting. <coughs> uh, 
Um, the problem here is that by running it as pairwise and covas, we're losing power due to controlling for the CV. So if you look here in the test of between subjects, I have, I'm still doing something with my CV. It's still in there. Um, and that's so I can get my estimated marginal means to be adjusted, but that does lose power when I try to test my main effect. Uh, I'm sorry, my interaction looking at that employment um, by each religion. So I have, I have missed it basically because I'm uh, controlling for the CV as well. And so that's why I said this, this is the easiest way to run these post hoc tests, but maybe not the best way. I have some other reasons why this will happen while you'll get a significant interaction, but not a significant post hoc, is that the differences in the means existed in the other comparisons. So instead of control comparing uh, employment and unemployment, maybe I should say for employed folks, none versus Catholic, none versus Jewish, none versus Protestant, etc. Um, then the, the significant difference might be there. Okay. Or um, if I had actually done that, I have in the notes because I tested it both ways, uh, I would have found a significant difference in, in unemployed groups. Or the differences in the means is in a strange combination that you wouldn't normally compare. So let's say it doesn't. Uh, you wanted to compare non-employed people to Jewish unemployed people. I don't really know why you would do that because, um, unless you had a good theory, because those are two very different types of people. Both of the conditions are different. Um, both of the levels are different, rather. But that might be where the significant difference is. So remember that interaction uh, effects happen because there is a significant difference in one of these means somewhere. Um, and so sometimes when you run post hocs, they don't turn out, which is sort of frustrating because then what do you do, right? <clears throat> uh, and then the, what I would say is reconsider what you're presenting. So think about um, maybe analyzing it the other way. Think about, like, do you really need all these groups? And so there are, there are a lot of ways to sort of um, reconceptualize your hypothesis or admit that the interaction is too small to be practically important. All right, that's option one. Um, you'll notice that I didn't calculate Cohen's D. Uh, it's unnecessary, because I have an effect size here. Um, so I don't need to calculate a double effect size. Um, and since I'm doing F tests, people expect to see eta. So I would report eta. That's option one. Option two is to use moat. <clears throat> so let me go set G power. Let me get rid of that. I want to use moat instead. <clears throat> now, moat at the moment does not include found p, so it doesn't give you these the actual p value. Coming soon, working on it. Um, so at some point, this may actually be the easiest option. Um, but you can use it to calculate t-test values for independent t only. Okay. So I'm going to go uh, for this particular problem. So it will calculate t-test values for dependent t, but not for ANCOVA. Okay, so this is very specific to independent t for ANCOVAs. So I'm going to measures independent t. So what I would do is I'm going to take this exact same box here. I'm going to do this the moat way. But instead of these two columns, let's trade these out. Let's do t and p and then code c. So what I'm going to do is take my marginal means, or my, um, sorry, condition means here, and compare them to each other by entering them into moat. So I'm going to do group 1, 7.76, 7.67, sorry, and then 7.12, because I'm comparing employed versus unemployed. I'm going to enter the standard errors, so skip the standard deviations, 0 0.17, 0 0.21, here and here. Um, and then in. Ah, oh, darn it, where is in? Well, the only place in conditional in appears is uh, way at the top. I'm assuming you haven't run all these tests where it has in way, way, way at the top here, okay, in this descriptive statistics box. So I'm going to have to come back up here. Don't use these means of standard deviations because they're unadjusted. I know it's a tiny difference, but in cases where the CV and the DV are correlated, a lot larger, let's say 0.5 or 0.6, they're going to be very different. Okay, so I'm 
don't do it. It's tempting, but don't. Um, so it's 46 and 30. So I'm going to go back over here, enter 46 and 30. There is T right there. So it tells me that T is 2 point... So degrees of freedom is here, so 0.74. I'm sorry, 74. And then here's T, 2.03. Okay. Cohen's D is here, 0.48. Now, what do I do with this number? I don't actually have the the P value, so do I know if that's significant or not? Okay. You could pull out a T table and look it up and see if it's less than 0.05, but that is like way too much trouble because people want you to tell them exact P. So let me calculate all the rest of these numbers and then we'll talk about how do I get exact P. At the moment when we don't have um, P values in moat. Like I said, coming soon. Right, so I'm going to do 7.69. So I'm going to compare this one to this one. To 8.04. And then skip my standard deviations, 0 0.14, 0 0.15. And it's not 46 and 30 anymore. It is 63.56. Okay, so it's 117 for my DF and 171. Cohen's D value is 0.31. And then I've calculated these other two, so I won't make you sit here and watch me type them all in. Um, but you could do it yourself by looking at the means and n. So remember, you always have to enter means, some form of standard something. 0.27 and n. So if I calculate all those out, t test wise. I end up with small effects, right? Because we knew the differences were small because the interaction was small. All right, how do I get exact P? Well, in the notes, I've given you a link to Vassar Stats, whose website is fantastic. They do lots of cool things. But I'm just going to Google it here. So I'm going to type in Vassar and then T2P. Because I want to go from a t test to a p to a p value, and then it pops up right here. <clears throat> There's a couple ways to get to this, but that's the fastest one I found. And what it'll let me do is type in my t values to two point oh three, and then calculate, and then also the degrees of freedom, so seventy four, and it will calculate two tailed p for me. So use two tailed p. Remember one tail's cheating. So my p-value for this one is basically 0.05. So this one is significant. And we'll come back to what does that mean here in a second. I could do the second one. So my t is negative 1.71, 117, 0.09, and then 1.75, 173. 0.08 and then this is clearly not significant because it's less than one but just to get the exact p-value 0.43 all right so there are my p-values so this first one is the only one that's significant the rest of these are not different And so for my significant test, I would go back and look at the means, and it seems to me that unemployed, none or other, have lower um, attitudes towards drugs. Okay. Employed, none or other, have more positive attitudes towards drugs. And that's what I would do to explain it. So that's your second option. Um, the only bad thing about moat at the moment is it doesn't have exact P. So that makes it um, it's easier to do because I don't have to do all the split file stuff. Um, not easier to do, but like it's it's sort of I take the numbers and I type them in, so I don't have to run all these extra things. But it is outside of SPSS, and it does require me to go find this extra table. Um, there is a third option, <clears throat> and that is to use an online t-test calculator. 
Okay, so the way I find this is I typed independent t, um, calculator, and then SE for standard error. This will make your life so much easier. So the first thing that pops up is graph pad. Um, there are several different ones. By several, I mean like there's actually a lot of them. But I like GraphPad's website. Um, it's pretty clear. They do have a bunch of ads, but you can get over it. So I'm going to click on GraphPad. This is the link provided in the notes. <clears throat> and it will let you calculate independent t. So here's our third option. Oops, I want to copy this box. Okay. Now, to do the independent t test and to do moat is to do the same thing. But if you didn't want to use Moat and you wanted to use this t-test calculator, you could do that. But then what you would have to do is go back to Moat to calculate d anyway. So it's about six one way and a half dozen the other at the moment. I'm going to get these exact same values, but let me show you how I got them. Okay. So I'm going to go to GraphPad. It has the option to let me enter the mean, standard error of the mean, and n. I'm going to pick that. So it's going to change and give me this little box here that I want to enter. Why did I pick the standard error? Well, that's what I have here in this box, so it makes my life a little easier. Um, you can do calculators where they only will let you enter the standard deviation. Remember that standard deviation is standard error over the square root of n. Um, and so what you would do is multiply your standard error times the square root of n to get standard deviation. Okay, so standard error times the square root of n is the standard deviation. Um, standard error is SD over the square root of N. I think I said that a little backwards a second ago. <clears throat> but if you calculate Cohen's D first, you get the standard error, um, or standard deviation, sorry, by entering standard error. So, you know, like I said, six, one, one, half dozen, the other, pick your favorite option. Does not matter, you get the same approximate results. So I would enter 7.67. My group two, so this is going across, is going to be 7.12. Standard error is 0.17 and 0.21. Okay. And then in, remember, the only place that is is in your descriptives box up here. So 63, and, I'm sorry, 46 and 30. <clears throat> and then click calculate now over here. And what it does. So this is the, we should get the same values as mode here, is it tells me, let's make this a little bigger so you can see it, the two tail p value equals 4.05, oh, 0.0455, or 0.05 rounding up. And it actually, just in case you aren't sure, tells you this is statistically significant. It gives you the confidence interval of the difference between the means, and then it gives me t and degrees of freedom. So 774, 2.03. And then I just like, the only reason I like this is that it gives me the p-value automatically. And then it summarizes my numbers down here just in case I wasn't sure. Um, but it does not give you effect size. If it gave you effect size, it would be great, but it doesn't. Um, it does give you, however, exact p. So you could use moat and vaster stats, or you could use this version of the t-test. That will give you um, all of your, uh, your post-hoc tests. So that is three different ways to do post hoc tests um, in between subjects and COVA. The only other suggestion I'm going to have is to make the graphs in Excel. So um, Excel slash Word, you can do it in both. So let me show you how to do that. But this is actually just a general overview of how do I make graphs in Excel and use their error bar functions. So this actually applies to everything we've done so far. It's just that SPSS's chart builder is um, sort of designed to sort of help you eliminate the use of Excel until you hit this point and you go, oh, threat. So for double repeated measures, this is actually a good thing to do as well. Um, I'm going to put that in another video so that you can um, watch it to apply to repeated measures or just in general if you wanted to do um, uh, uh, between subjects as well. Um, so you'll want to go watch the video on how to make charts in Excel slash Word um, complete with error bars to be able to finish a, an ANCOVA to present the, the data in an appropriate way. And then when you are working on writing these up, you want to make sure, even if it's not significant, 
to include the main effects for the CV, so the F values for the CV, the interaction, and the two main effects. Okay, so you actually have four Fs, CV, main effect one, main effect two, interactions. And then the post hoc tests in whatever form that you did them in. So it might be four ANCOVAs or it might be four T tests. Okay, and all of those should include effect size. So for your um, pairwise ANCOVAs, it's going to be partial eta squared. For your T tests, that's going to be T and D. Okay. So go watch the video on how to make a chart in Excel, and then you'll be able to do um, charts for ANCOVAs.